Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome, everyone. I am your host, Joe Pavlansky, pop culture historian, writer for Scary Monsters magazine, and curator of the Crypt of Classics. Co-hosting, as always, is the maestro of mail-order mysteries, and owner of HouseOfTheUnusual.com, the intrepid Eddie Guevara. Tonight's special guest is an advertising creative services manager, a mail order maniac, and as described by Eddie, a man of indelible character, Todd Machen. How's everyone doing tonight, guys? Everybody's fine. How about you, Todd? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, Joe, thanks for that introduction. That was awesome. Hey, Uh, wait a second. What are you thanking him? What's going on here? Already starting in the wrong ball here, uh, Mr. Todd. <laughs> well, I got to so bring something what? up to you guys. Okay. Mr. Todd okay. here has been complaining that he hasn't received <laughs> his aqua specs yet. <laughs> I sent him out the same day and he called me back that evening saying that he went to the mailbox and it wasn't there. i tell you what, man. This mail order stuff, it is like a, it is like time travel back to my childhood. <laughs> it's like and i think that's why uh ebay is so great is because it's like you know it, you're just transported back it's like as soon as you order something you're just salivating for it to get in the mail oh i i i know what you're talking about man and that's what you know when i first met eddie and started getting you know really getting into the mail order stuff man i i, I felt like i was a little kid again and i think i posted it on the uh the web page and i'd also mentioned it to eddie man you know when i I got my first pair of x-ray specs from him a couple of years ago and I put them on and I said, man, these things are crap. And then I put them on again and I'm like, man, these things are great crap. You know, and I, I was just like a little kid again, you know, I'm like, man, these are great. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I think, uh, you know, and you, and you read a lot online, you hear a lot of guys that will complain about their, their mail order experiences from their youth and they order something and they, you know, were, you know, It was soul crushing, you know, they were so disappointed in what they got. But the funny thing for me was, and I know this is true of Eddie, and it's probably true of you too, Joe, man, just looking at that picture in that advertisement and picturing what that thing was going to be, the imagination it sparked, and then, you know, so you have all of that, uh, you know, that was, that right there was fun. That right there was worth the cost of the, of the price and then it was the waiting for it to come in the mail yeah you know it, it was it, it was almost like like a drug like you know you see the ad and you're like oh man this is going to be great and then you receive it and you're like oh man this is crap but you know i'm going to try it one more time because this ad looks good and then you know you just keep going over and over and over <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah i so I, I guess now we got Eddie to blame for that, for, you know, being in the uh, the present day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank good we well, have Eddie to continue on this crappy tradition. Well, he, here's the best part. I had Joe a few weeks ago when he met me, you know. I mean, not met me, of course. He got back to me. He wanted a refund for his x-ray glasses. <laughs> he said they didn't work. <laughs> yeah. you that? Well, he, here's the best part. The one I like the best is, like you said, Todd is the expert male. Or, I mean, Todd's got the ultimate plan he's putting out. He's trying to sell me invisible crabs. (laughs) Now, he says if I put them inside the bowl, because I'm afraid of crabs, he says you can keep them. You don't have to feed them. But here's the best angle of of his product. But you know what? You send him invisible money. (laughs) Well, that's, that's actually, it was actually not invisible. I send them, but here's the best thing. When he said, here's what he said to me. If God forbid there was a mom that, the, you know, would be upset because the kid would say, hey, listen, you know, I bought this mom. And the mom is like, what did you buy? And he says, well, it's here. And she goes, you got nothing. And he says, well, yeah, it was nothing that I bought. <laughs> and the, the thing is that if he goes to court and the mom wants to take Todd to court and the judge says, "Your Hon-, um, she says, uh, your honor, this man sold my son nothing. And the judge would say, well, to the kid, well, what did you buy from this man? And he says, nothing. <laughs> Then there's no case. <laughs> you you know what I'm saying? That's a perfect mail order item. It's a perfect mail order item. That is the art of true mail order. 
<laughs> oh yeah, a nice a nice ad and and a a slightly uh, less nicer product. <laughs> well. I mean, Todd, because, you know, I sent him the ghost and I wanted him to experience the true 1970s <laughs> dream. You know what I'm saying? I wanted him to not only have to wait for the ghost, but to feel the anxiety of waiting. Yeah. So uh, so he was complaining for me and all this stuff. And then he called it back and he write, and he sends me a box and he calls it the house of the unusable. Okay. <laughs> You want me to read my review of my my experience with you, Eddie? Yes, I like for you yes, to hear for Joe here to listen. Okay, here goes. So this was my response after getting my first package from Eddie Gavour at uh, House of the Unusual. So it says, "So I ordered your seven foot life size ghost that I would be able to control myself." I was expecting to receive an actual ghostly spirit of a tall deceased man that I could command to scare the crap out of my family, friends, and coworkers. Instead, I got a sheet of paper, a string, a balloon, <laughs> and a piece of crappy plastic. <laughs> what a ripoff! What kind of scam are you running there at House of the Unusual? You should change your name to House of the Unusable. This is junk. <laughs> And on top of that, it took forever for it to arrive. <laughs> well, here's the best part about that. Since he did that, you know, I felt like he changed my whole destiny. So I said, you know, the house of the unusable has to become usable again. So what I did is there's a little device. It's a box. It's called the useless box. And what it does is when you turn the lever on, it turns itself off. It has no use whatsoever. <laughs> so that's going to be my main product from now on. You have to be unusable. <laughs> oh, that would be great. You could play with that thing forever. <laughs> well, that's courtesy of Todd here, you know? Well, I, but, uh, I have... Now, let me ask you something, Todd. Did you... When, when you got your box of the seven-foot ghost, because I'm I, I'm still in a dilemma. Now, years ago, I got I got a seven-foot ghost from Eddie, and it was, it was in the envelope, all this stuff. But I recently got his his special edition box. And I, I, I just can't take it out of the box. It's, you know, it's up on my shelf. It displays nice. I just don't want to open it. So did you actually open your That's box? That's exactly how mine is. It's sitting right in front of me, uh, right above my computer. You control seven foot life-size ghost signed by Craig Tarback. Yeah. And still in the box. Yeah. I, I love it. I mean, it, it looks absolutely gorgeous on, on my shelf that just the, the design of the box and everything alone, it was well worth it. So if anybody out there is on the fence about this seven foot ghost and they're getting a piece of plastic in a balloon, the box is well worth it. I, I, I'm, I'm tell you that right now. You know, though, that was so true of products back then is man, the packaging was a lot of times it was most of it. The packaging was ingenious. It was titillating. It got it, you know, it just, it, the words they used, the graphics, it just sucked you right in. And then the product inside was next to nothing. Uh, and, you know, and, and speaking of, of the packaging, I got um, about a year or so ago, I a, a good buddy of mine had some old um, Captain Marvel uh, cereal premiums from, I, I believe it was either the late 40s or early 50s. I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But he had the original shipping package, and they're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, there's, you know, a printed design of Captain Marvel oh, on the outside yeah. of it. And, you know, it's just not a plain brown envelope. I mean, the envelope itself is, is, is a piece of art, you know, and, and you just don't see that too much anymore. Yeah, that's how Sea Monkeys used to come. When you ordered Sea Monkey supplies, and it was a, like a three-dimensional item, so they had to send it in a box. It came in a little printed box with a sea monkey on the outside of it. And it said like, uh, you know, caution perishable sea monkeys on the inside. And, um, and the box itself was really cool. Now, do we know if any of those boxes still exist? I got two. Well, you really? he already oh, answered wow. the question. Bro. <laughs> yeah, I guess he answered so. The question. <laughs> well, but he hasn't told you this, that he has socks, his pants, his, <laughs> his bed sheets. <laughs> And the pillowcase are all sea monkeys. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean he's he's the number one sea monkey guy in the country. That is awesome. Yeah. Oh, see, I wish I I could have put that in your uh, in your bio so we could start over again. And our special guest, the number one sea monkey guy in the world. <laughs> in, in in fact, he was trying to tell me 
that the sea monkeys grow. And, you know, I had the thing and I even looking through a microscope, I can never see the darn thing. It might be like his invisible crabs. I don't know. <laughs> this is the whole thing. Well, <laughs> Joe, have you ever had sea monkeys? I've had them many times. Oh, you have? Joe? Yeah, yeah I, I had them. I, I believe I had them like around, I'm thinking the late 80s that, that I was able to get my, I don't remember how, if I got them from a comic book or if I got them from the corner, you know, drugstore yeah. or something, but I do remember getting them and I do remember being very disappointed. <laughs> well, he, here, here's the fun. You Can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story, guys, a story about sea monkeys? Let's hear it. Okay. The sea monkeys, I've always, since I was a kid, I've always had them back and forth. But when I was eight or nine years old, I found out through a fish, a fish store that I had visited for whatever reason. And I don't know why I asked the, the salesman if they sold sea monkeys. Now, th this is an odd question coming out of a kid, uh, you know, in a fish store when you see you can order them, you know. And the guy goes, yes, I do. So he, for 50 cents, he brings me out a little, like, you, you know, when you go to Chinese restaurants that they give you. They put like the sauce in a little plastic cup like that. Yeah. He gives me a plastic cup filled with what was called brine shrimp, which were the sea monkeys. So I go home with these things. And the first thing I'm looking is like, how in the world do they paint them with, you know, heads and feet and all this? And this thing looked like, <laughs> a, like the skeleton of a fish, you know? So they're swimming, whatever. So, I, you know, I put them into the sea monkey jar that I had, obvious, with the different things. And now they were fully grown. I think they lasted, I don't know, a couple of weeks or a week or so, and then they died, and I bought them again. Well, anyway, I decided to go the old route. As I got older and I got married, one day I, I bought a set of sea monkeys, and I put them, and, you know, I, I do everything, put the powder in and stuff, and believe it or not, they're actually coming alive. Two days later, you could see microscopic things moving. My wife is cleaning. She knocks it down. She doesn't tell me. She fills it with water again. <laughs> a week later... <laughs> You know, my brother-in-law does the same. He knocks it down and fills it with water. So I'm thinking the sea monkeys are still there. And I'm like, what the heck? How come they're not growing? Then I found out what they did to me, you know? But <laughs> now, see, I remember I remember when I first got this, the sea monkeys. I was probably seven or eight years old, somewhere around there. And, you know, I seen the nice packaging. I remember, you know, the ads in the comic books and all that. So I'm like, man, this is going to be great. I'm going to have, you know, my own king and queen and all these you know, workers and all that. I could teach them to jump through hoops and everything and put them in the water. And I said, what the heck is this, man? I felt like, like Ralphie from a Christmas story when he had the, uh, um, the little orphan, anything. He's like a crummy commercial. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing that was interesting about sea monkeys is cause I did try the, um, cause they had an ad, I think honor house used to sell this, uh, if for a sea monkey circus or something. And it was, I mean, I've never saw it with, uh, Harold in Trans Science or any of that stuff running it, but Honor House did have an old dad, and you can find those usually in the Dell comics, the one for like 12 cents on the cover, the feature Beetle Bailey and stuff like that. And the ad inside, it said that, you know, it follows lights and all that. So I did notice, though, if you take a light now, the light I'm talking about when I was younger was those pen lights that the doctors would use. My uncle had given one to my grandmother, so I, I used to always play with it. And I, I would shut off the lights, and it's true, when you flash, flash the light right to the sea monkeys themselves, they do all come to where the light is. So if you move the light, yeah. they go to, you know, they follow the light. So that's oh, wow. how, how Harold, you know, said that you can teach them tricks. It's just that they just react to light as a creature, not because you can actually train them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know. It's like anything in mail order, man. They promised, uh, they promised you the moon, and, and you didn't even get past the sky. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, <laughs> but yeah, they they promise you the moon and send you a, a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> At least you got it, though. You got the moon. You know. There's a shred of truth in all of the in all of those hyperbolic lines, though. You know, it's like. Oh, could you could you imagine the outcry today? Oh if, yeah. If some of those ads were out and and people got this stuff i mean there would be lawsuits out the wazoo man. Absolutely. Well, well you know what i agree with you in that but believe it or not today those hats are out there but in a different way like for example i remember one time i was trying to run an ad and, and, and this is a funny story though um when i first started in mail order i started with books and there was one company that i saw an ad in one of the the famous uh magazines of it wasn't entrepreneur i think it was in business 
And it says you can make, tw- you know, up to $1,000 a week with an answering machine. So I, I thought it was kind of cool. And I sent away for the information. When I got the information, it said that for $29, you would get like a, a pre-recorded message and you could run ads in the papers and stuff like that, you know? And you would sell supposedly a home worker's guide to employment. It was the name of the one product that I did. So I sent away for it. And for like another $75, I got a custom uh, leaderless tape that I bought in Radio Shack at the time. And I put it into an answering machine, the the cassette tape answering machines. And it would, you know, constantly go in, in, in a loop. And what I did with that is I ran an ad in the local paper. And I think my ad, if I remember, was imagine you can earn 300 plus per week without leaving your home. Call today for details. And let me tell you, I got a second line at, in, into my house. I forgot how much that cost me, like 100 bucks or whatever. But I got to be honest with you. When the under the help wanted section of the local paper, when that came out, it was phenomenal. I had over 100 calls a day. And they started turning into between six and 10 orders a week, which was not bad because I was making $19.85 an order after shipping the product because it was $24.95 and buying the booklet. So from there, I went on one time to read a book. In, but there was a famous mail order guy in California called Melvin Powers. He's the guy that a lot of you people might not have ever noticed, but he's the one that did hypnotic control. Uh, Inside Hypnotism. There's a lot of books on hypnotism from the 1950s and about horse races, and that was Melvin Powers. So he also had the Wilshire Book Company, which was out of California. Now, he's passed away a a while back, but what I did at the time was, as I read his book, um, I I think it was How to Make a Million in Mail Order, which was a really great book. And one day, you know, I, I run an ad, but now when I went to run the ad, I'm a newbie now. Okay, I don't have any experience. I'm new. There's no way anybody's going to, you know, actually, what, what, what I mean by that is that a lot of the magazines, if they did not know who you were or you were nobody, they could reject your ad. So your, your ad would get uh, uh, scrutinized by the magazines, depending what you said. So when I, my ad at the time that I came up with was make millions in mail order, secrets revealed, you know, send for information, whatever it was. And they said that I was offering a fictitious number and they returned my ad. They didn't put it on the magazine. So here, lo and behold, I go in the book and I call up Mr. Powers and I go to him, um, sir, uh, this, this and that, you know, I, I, I was trying to run this ad. What do you think? And he goes, I don't see anything wrong with it. Well, <laughs> a month later, I pick up a, an issue of, um, of uh, popular science and lo and behold, there's an ad that says, millionaire mail order reveal secret and i was like wow man this guy just swiped my ad man but you know <laughs> the, the funny thing he he ran that ad for the next maybe five years so i guess it was very profitable what he did was just twist the words around a little bit same thing happened with the seven foot ghost when i first joined forces with lou and we started the original fun factory um, I wanted to reproduce the ghost. Now, I said, should we get it done in China? So I contacted a company in China that was willing to do it. And I think they quoted me at the time a price of like 80 cents a ghost, right? So at that time, the company Sun Hill Industries was growing big in the United States. And they were selling lawn and leaf bags that had, you know, the images of the ghost. And not the, not, not that ghost, but it had like Frankenstein and different. And people yeah. would fill, uh, fill them up with lawn, you know, not lawn, the uh, leaves. And they would put it in their lawn. So I said, let me contact this company because they're right up my alley. So I get a hold of a company. I forgot who the lady was. I I do have her name, believe it or not, uh, somewhere where I recorded her information. And I sent her at the time. I faxed her because this is the time we don't have email. We have a fax machine. And I faxed her copies of the different uh, seven-foot ghost ads from the Melton Company, Honor House, and Whatever it was, she got a liking to it. She calls me back a week later and says, hey, would you be able to send me a sample? So Lou goes to me, don't no, don't send her anything because, you know, they're going to cop, whatever. Anyway, fast forward. One day I go into one of those Halloween stores that happen on, you know, they have every season on yeah. Halloween, they open up those shops throughout this, you know, the country inside malls for like a month or so. And when I walk in, lo and behold, Sun Hill Industries has... The seven-foot ghost with flashing eyes 
and they got the se a seven foot witch with flashing eyes. The price was like nine seventy five for each one. I bought it and I was fuming. I go, man, this lady, <laughs> what a character, man! She stole my idea. Well, not I know the funny part about it. This is the thing that I, I know Todd is gonna laugh at me, but. About a year later, I'm going to Florida. And, you know, I drove to Florida because I didn't really like flying. So I drove like 27 times to see my family down there. So I'm with my wife. And I think my oldest daughter was, I don't know, a few years. And I believe my son was a baby or not even born yet. And when I'm driving down to Florida and I stop in one of those Dollar General stores, lo and behold, seven foot ghosts with flashing eyes from China for one dollar. <laughs> I was so pissed. <laughs> that I literally stopped over 30 times and I bought every ghost in every shop so that people wouldn't get it. Because I go, this is like my product. What the heck, you know? So <laughs> I actually didn't even try putting out the ghost until, you know, a couple of years later because they saturated the market. Now, today I do own about 400 or 300, whatever it is, of those ghosts because I bought them. okay? I just didn't want them to be out there. So that's the way a lot of those marketing companies will, will do. But the, the thing that, you know, as we're talking, one thing I just found out today, which shocked me, is we all know the story of Famous Monsters of Filmland. We know that is the granddaddy of all famous magazines out there that deal with horror. And, I mean, they used to own Creepy Magazine or Warren Publishing, yeah, Warren. the one that owned it with, um, you know, with Forrest J. Ackerman, who was the editor in chief whatever, they used to put out a lot of magazines in the in the years, right? And there is, by, by Todd, you were looking for that particular ad. That ad was featured that you wanted with the x-ray glasses when it was called the Monster Vision or Horror Vision. Uh -huh. You'll find that ad in all the 10 issues of Monster World. Okay. That, see, there was a time that Famous Monsters did not publish any mo Famous Monsters. And in between, they filled them with those 10 issues of Monster World. And those are considered part of the original circulation. You will find the ad in, in, in those issues. But what I was saying is that the Captain Company, which in reality never produced a catalog, they, they did sometimes make flyers like photocopies of the pages inside that they would include with orders from people. I mean, two people. Well, in 2000 and something, or maybe the late, early 90s, I don't remember the exact time, another person decided to republish Famous Monsters of Filmland. And then this person, which I, I'm not going to mention the name because I, I don't remember. I think it was something fairy, but I don't remember his name. He went, at first he started good with Forrest J. Ackerman, and then he went into a legal battle with him over the rights of Famous Monsters for whatever reason. Um, a, a lot of the people, a lot of the collectors blackballed him because they didn't want nothing to do with anybody who went against Forrest J. Ackerman. OK, so apparently what happened with that situation, which I don't recall right now, I know it's in the history and it's been a while since I've even looked into it. I just brought it up today for the reason what I'm about to say. Anyway, the company continued publishing somehow Famous Monsters of Filmland. You could buy it in Barnes and Noble. I think you could buy it online in Amazon. Well, I was just looking curi curiously before at Facebook, and I realized that the Captain Company and the company that produced Famous of Monsters of Filmland went out of business March 1st of 2020. Wow. So th the story with this is, that really shocked me, is that not only did Johnson Smith Company go out of business December 31st of 2019, which is this last December, after 114 years, now the Captain Company, the last remaining thing of the era, has gone out of business. Uh, I, I don't know if it's for financial reasons, whatever it is. The, the actual thing is funny because I actually emailed the guy whose name is Phil. I think it's, a, it's, it's some guy named Phil. I forgot the last name. I emailed him about an hour ago and I said, hey, Phil, listen, before the Captain Company disappears, why don't you give me a call? Maybe House of the Unusual can somehow join forces. It would be great because, I mean, who doesn't know the Captain Company, you know? Right. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd bring that information up because it kind of shocked me before when I came across it. Now, with sea monkeys and stuff like that, I know Todd, man, Todd has 
created, I mean, I've seen pictures of his collection and I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that his collection is probably close to mine. And if I know I said it playing around, but I wouldn't be surprised if when he gets off the show, he probably says, how in the world did Eddie know that I had my underwears and socks of the season? <laughs> but th that's what I'm saying. I, I, <laughs> but you want to tell us a little bit more, Todd, about the history of it? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what I'll tell you. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the 60th anniversary of Sea Monkeys, which is very exciting. 2020, 60th anniversary of Sea Monkeys. The product came out late in 1960, and I came out in early 1961. So literally, Sea Monkeys and I have grown up together over the decades. And that was just one of those things, you know, like the ghost spoke to you, the ghost ad spoke to you, the Sea Monkey ad spoke to me. and Man, I looked at that thing and I just envisioned, like Joe was saying, like, you know, being like the ruler of my sea monkey kingdom. I mean, I was determined I was going to be the best sea monkey owner that ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> so I set away for my sea monkeys. The first kit would have been an, a honey toy industry kit from the 1960s. And then every, you know, five years, 10 years, something like that, I would get a new one, see what was going on with the graphics and uh, order things from Yolanda at Trans Science Corporation. And, um, and then it just got out of hand. Kind of, yeah, yeah, that's, that's how yeah, collecting usually yeah. happens. It just it gets out of hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, now I want, I know we were talking about ads and all that and I, Todd, I'm not sure if you know this, and I know Eddie has told me about it before, but Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, you were one of the last or the last to have mail order uh, mystery type items uh, advertised in a comic book in, in the 80s. Is that correct? What happened with that? The, yeah, the story with that is that Johnson Smith Company first introduced mail order novelties in the number one issue of Superman, Action Comic Number 1. The back cover is a mail order ad from Johnson Smith. In 2000, when the comic books uh, of Casper and Richie Rich started to resurface again after years of not being published, Johnson Smith started running. They had some deal. Where I, I, and I can tell you what the price was because I called uh, the comics at the time, Harvey Publications, in order to do the same thing. And they were quoting me at $750. Now, the advantage of that thing was that the circulation being low, it was $750. And you would get your ad to run, if I am correct, for six months for that price. Meaning you paid $750, but they will run for six months straight. It's not like you had to pay $750 each month. Yeah, that's pretty good. And that, that was phenomenal. Yeah. So I when I went to jump on the boat, of course always being behind the times, uh, the publications, I believe, were sold to Disney. And Disney took ownership of Richie Rich and all that stuff. If I'm if I'm correct in saying that, I could be wrong, but I remember, I think it was Disney who, who took it over. And I go, oop, there goes Casper. So what happened after that, the wrestling magazines gave me that opportunity of running ads. And I started with a half-page ad in a magazine called Wrestling Eye. Um, the year of publication of that is like the mid eighties. I don't, I have to get the magazine and see the actual year and month. I don't remember when I started with that. And I sold the seven foot ghost and a pair of uh, sports binoculars. That was my half page ad. Um, right after that, there were several companies that came out, Brad's fun shop. Uh, I forgot some of the others. And they started hitting the, the the market with a lot of ads in the, you know, in the wrestling magazines, and and some of the magazines were also uh, magazines such as, uh, we, which is is ironic that they would run it in that, but they would run it in, in Gun Digest, uh, they would run it in Guns and Ammo, the same ads that they were running in in in, um, in wrestling magazines. Now, what happened is that as Wrestling faded, not faded, but the popularity of it became bigger and stuff. But magazine print faded. 
the ads themselves faded with. And then in 1993, well, the, the winter, it was actually to go on sale on February of 93. But when I had it put on the February issue of DC Comics, the comic books went on sale in, this, in early December, mid-December, which it, it was kind of ironic. I didn't really want to do that because that was not a good month for mail order. I wanted to actually go on sale January. But somehow, I, I think I miscalculated, and we run the ad. Me and Lou, of course, uh, ran, but the cost was <laughs> definitely not seven fifty; was five thousand dollars for one month. So oh, wow! What happened was when we con- connected with uh, the person running DC Comics, and he this this fellow was there for many years. His name was actually Bernie Slotnick, and he was the uncle of the girl who was in charge of Archie Comics, and. Um, Oh, she did the ads for Archie Comics. So this guy had been with DC for like 40 some odd years. And it was kind of interesting because here is how you know people. When I try to run an ad in DC Comics by myself, it was like I had to go to all these hurdles just to get there. When Lou comes on board, since he was the original owner of Fun Factory and had a record with DC Comics, it was like, no problem, Lou, you got it. You pay for it later, you know, that type of thing. And we ran the ad. So what happened is 1993 was the last time a mail order company of novelties, meaning jokes and magic, ran in any comic book. So, yes, Fun Factory ran, which is House of the Unusual today, ran their ad in 93. So that does make me and this is something somebody can, you know, Google or check themselves. My company was the last company that ever ran an ad for novelties in a comic book. And prior to that, it had been 10 years since Johnson Smith or anybody had ran an ad in DC Comics. Like I said, Johnson Smith did have in between the 10 year period that they're talking about because DC Comics did not get, or even Marvel Comics, any ads for novelties. But when Harvey Publications republished itself, um, that took place now. What my other thing that I try to do at the time, since I let's be honest, it's very hard and tough, uh, you know, being married and stuff and being a one man operation to be able to afford ads of that extent. And even though they were very profitable at the end, but you got to understand, unlike the internet, when you put an ad today and within a week you have orders, back then you had to put an ad, wait three months for the ad to come out. If the ad worked, the, the general rule of thumb was within the first 30 days, you got about 50% of your orders and then other 50% would trickle in the next six months. So you now see if you, you remember now, now see if people are, are thinking, you know, cause you put in a, a $5,000 ad for, for DC comics and, and some of our younger you know listeners might not realize that back in the early nineties and, and pretty much through all the nineties is that DC comics was selling, you know, distributing and selling upwards of a million comics, not like today where it's, you know, 20, 30,000. So they were, they were going upwards of a, of a million comics that were being distributed. So you were really hitting a, uh, a wide audience there with the, with the advertisements too. The, the situation, it was kind of interesting is that I think the ad pulled in a little bit over $20,000, uh, that particular thing. So yes. And it was kind of tough. I got to be honest with you. It was very tough to read the handwritings of a lot of kids that was handed in. And the funny thing <laughs> is, this is going to make a lot of people laugh. I still have 95% of those orders in the original envelope with the original order form attached to it. In fact, I have about six shoe boxes <laughs> with a oh, couple wow. of hundred envelopes. So I have every order that ever came in through Fun Factory. Now, that's a great piece of history there, too. That to it have. is. It, it was actually going to be featured in, in uh, Mail Order Mysteries by Kirk Damaris, but I think the company edited out that particular picture. Um, but I'm going to tell you something, though, honestly. The, the situation with anything with mail order is um, my dream was always to do kind of like the Captain Company, which is kind of sad that, that it's fading away now because – I always wanted to have a see the way the Captain Company made its business was that they had a publication that attracted the young generation. And at the same time, they had a publication that was their storefront. They would sell through their publication. And the idea behind it made them successful for 40 years or whatever it was. And 
let me say one thing about this. What I was trying to do was actually duplicate that same idea. And back in 1984, there was a friend of mine who is, he published a magazine called Stoner's Monster Mayhem. And we kind of started with that idea of, you know, putting a full page ad, which I did. I, I had a full page ad in his publication. But you know what? The publication, it, it was stopped. It didn't continue more than a couple of months. And I only ran it one time in his publication. I think it was the 1984 issue. And there's a, a whole story, like two article, two page article spread about me there. Um, I think you can online get a copy of that fan scene or look inside because I think I've seen it. And you could see the story I'm talking about. Now, when I forgot when it was around the time of the mid 80s, uh, Felix the Cat was beginning to get published again. And the guy I remember calling the company and the guy I spoke with, he said his grandfather, I forgot his name, had started Felix the Cat, had been the original artist for it. So I asked him about running a full page in the Felix the Cat publications and I was excited because they said, yeah, we definitely will we'll take a full page. And when I was ready to run it, the company went out of business out of oh, nowhere, wow. you know, overnight. And that kind of shocked me. So then left me again in the air. So what I did is in 2008, I was still with the idea that the only way, the best and affordable way to run a mail order company would be create a publication, create a fanzine that you can run ads within the fan scene and people would buy. So I created a, a, a fan scene at the time. I did one issue, uh, which got 26 subscribers because I, I, I stopped. I didn't do any more. And it was called Ghost Ship Times. And what I did within that magazine is as I had stories about the mail order industry and all that stuff and the different products, I would put throughout the magazine ads for the novelties I was selling. So I was trying to do a captain company. I was yeah. basically trying to imitate what they were doing. Now, well, if any, if anybody still, you know, has that nostalgic feeling for, for, for captain company, and I remember them, you know, in the old scary monsters I used to buy. But when I, I started reading, um, scary monsters magazine in the nineties, in the late nineties, um, the original publisher, uh, Dennis Drake Dennis, he did kind of like a captain company for scary monsters in the back of his magazine. So the last 10 pages or so was all, um, you know, movies, t-shirts, toys, memorabilia, anything for monsters. And it's still um, in the current scary monsters magazine. So if anybody, you know, is looking for that type of mail order, if they pick up uh, the current issue of scary monsters, they could see the last 10, 12 pages. or So it's just like the old captain company, you know, it's, it's the pulp, paper and everything black and white and they it still has all the the mail order stuff back there and you know it's it's a great selection of stuff just like they would find you know in, in the the vintage scary monsters magazines the 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 interesting part about when you say scary monster didn't they obtain the rights to castle of frankenstein which was another fan scene at the time I, i'm not sure if they obtained the the rights of it i i know that um they have some uh, upcoming uh, dealings going on with it. I, I not really much I could say of it right now, but in the future there there will be an issue um, talking about Castle of Frankenstein. But I, I'm not sure who actually has the rights uh, to that right now. Um, Todd, yep. can you shed some more light in the Sea Monkey uh, Empire? <laughs> Back to the Sea uh -huh. Monkeys. <laughs> No, I, I, I was saying because I want to bring something in about the, uh, what we were just talking. I, I'm not, we were just talking about this, you know, the, the scary monsters in Castle Frankenstein, but I, I, I want to ask Todd this question now to get back to that subject in a second, and I'll explain what I, why I'm say, asking that. Go ahead, Todd. What do you want me to tell you? <laughs> sure. I mean, okay, are you, uh, is there any particular possibility that you might be that you might have some future with sea monkeys well <clears throat> yeah i'll tell you this uh, and unfortunately there's not a whole lot that i can say because some things are in uh, the works at the moment but um if anybody is is interested if anybody has a hankering and in getting back in touch with their childhood 
go to seamonkeys.com. Uh, it's S-E-A hyphen monkeys.com. Um, the the a widow of the guy who created this, the heiress of the sea monkey, you know, uh, fortune. She, she's running the business now, um, and she's doing, um, you know, like there's a couple, there's a couple of legs to her business. There's the big uh, toy store, you know, multi, uh, big, big marketing. Um, Dragon Eye Toys is the company that's making the sea monkey kits. But then she's doing like online orders, little cottage industry type things, smaller runs. Um, we have out currently a 60th anniversary poster um, that features like sea monkey kits from the past. There's a lot of greeting cards. Um, I know what I'm doing after <laughs> we're done with this. <laughs> well, and she just she just launched her very first kit, which is called the Sea Monkey Executive Super Size Suite. It's a four, four times the size for four times the fun. This is her creation. I helped her develop it with some of the printed collateral. Um, it's a big, beautiful kind of glass ball that's that's huge. And um, it, anyway, it's it's a great spot. Well, I'm I'm going to bring uh, the reason I mentioned and I asked you about that is because Joe and myself, you know, we were talking about magazines, and the reason I changed the conversation real quick to ask you about that is because. Joe suggested that I bring back Ghost Ship Times and he wants to like take it over. And you know what? Joe's got the ability for that. And I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to try to do that. See, the whole idea is. Wait, could, 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 could me and Todd hear that one more time? <laughs> well, yes, I, I figured, hey, you know, why not? We're going to do that because the you know what, Joe, it's it's a great magazine to put back. I, I had a tough time doing it. Uh, I mean, you're you're a guy who, he, here's the whole thing. Todd, uh, I, I had to convince him for about an hour last <laughs> night that we should bring it back. You know, I, I was because he sent me an, an e copy of it, and I said, dude, this thing's like, this is amazing. I, I said, this is like awesome. And, and there, there's so much that we could that we could do with it. And it, it's just an awesome little publication. I said, you know, there's there's still a market out there for, you know, paper products. People still like, yeah. You know, you know, having stuff in their hands, yeah. but you could still also offer it nowadays as an e-version right. too. So you could o offer both versions and put all this information in there and it would be just a fun thing to do. I told him, I said, you know what I said? It's, it would just, be, it would be fun to just do it. I said, even if we don't make money or if it doesn't, I said, I just want to do it. I said, it, it just sounds like a right. blast. It's, it's Well, that's the whole thing. And the reason I kind of asked that with uh, Todd is because, you know, Todd, we could become that avenue where you guys start running ads on, you know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. That that's what I was thinking because there is a, a monster magazine. I mean, I think his his name is Bob. He does, I think, the Monster Con, whatever it is, in uh, Philadelphia. And what's the name of that magazine, uh, Joe? Which one? Monster World, is it? The magazine. I know there's a there's a few other. No, there's no, the a few one of from them. Bob. The one from Bob in in that uh, Comic Con. He goes to chill at theater sometimes. No, um, I'm not familiar with that one. Might be Monster World. Yeah, yeah, Monster World. Okay, I, I got a, a mental blank on that right now. It's a really nice, glossy magazine and stuff. And what he does, though, sometimes he reproduces the ads inside, but for or fun. Or are you talking about Monster Bash? Monster Bash, that's correct. I'm sorry. I, I know. I'm... Oh, yeah, that's Ron Adams' publication. Ron Adams, he, that's correct. He has the Monster Bash conference right. out in um, it's, uh, it's a well-done magazine, but you know what? It's... It's it's a great magazine, but you know the whole thing is it would be nice to take charge of our own magazine, to have control as to what the items are, and I'm all for it. I mean, I'm going to go with what Joe is saying. We're probably going to launch it soon, and Todd, maybe you know more than Gray, you you could probably you know be part of yeah, this. Send, send me an e copy of it, and I'll take a look. Now you're asking too much, Todd. I mean, what is it? What <laughs> e -copy? man? Can't look, he's you like regular mail. <laughs> Already wanted demands. <laughs> you, you know, you know what's so funny about this? We were talking about that. I sold my last copy by I, I forget what I mean. I don't have a darn copy on me. I'm gonna have to probably print. But the thing is that there was somebody selling it on eBay, and I, I, I was gonna it. go buy it, and uh, I realized I said, "Sheesh, man, it sold out." Just after I was talking to Joe last night, and somebody must have bought bought it, and I'm like, "Wow, man, that kind of sucks," because I. 
I, I, I really like to see the actual because I forgot yeah. what the cover is like and stuff. But you know, having said that, you know, Todd, it's um, it's a great idea. We should definitely look into into continuing this. There's so much in the subject out there. There's so many people out there that are coming to our. And what I would recommend, Todd, if if you have a chance and you go on Facebook and just like me and Joe been doing, I've gone to Facebook where there's a lot of fan pages that are um, people they're selling or, or or you know monster related stuff. Befriend them, befriend them, and push them over because House of the Unusual itself, it's a platform that we're creating now, not just a website that used to sell the novelty items. Right. I'm trying to create it with Joe into a platform where it becomes a forum where all the collectors come and meet. Yeah. And there, you know, yes, we can launch certain projects like we're going to do, but it's going to be know, a great place. Yeah. That, that's why I like the House of the Unusual forum because, you know, you could go on Facebook and, you know, you have a thousand different pages and you got to go to one page for this, one page for that, where, you know, at House of the Unusual, it's it's a pretty much catch-all. You know, everything's there and you could talk about whatever collectible you like you know in one place you don't have to go to yeah. you know search a million in one pages and it's you know it, it's a good time you know i've been having a good time on there well, yeah and, and what let I me just... say this eddie because uh, i'm not into social media that's one thing that you know i've, I've kind of stayed clear of but what i do like about the house of uh, unusual forum is it doesn't automatically link you with every person that you've ever known and never wanted to see again like Facebook does <laughs> Well, you, know, I actually... you go there and you make your account and you are in the midst of people who have the same kind of interests that you do. They might, you know, might have a little different take on it. They might be obs obsessed with something that's a little bit different, but it's that kind of collector mentality, that whole kind of community. Well, yeah. And you know what? And I, I told Eddie the other day, if I don't know if anybody caught his, uh, the new, um, video that he put on youtube but i was watching it and he started talking about the the monster section of uh kirk damaris's book mail order mysteries and i said oh man i said this is going to be trouble now i said now i'm going to be searching ebay and all over for all these <laughs> these horror themed you know uh mail order mystery items I said, but you know because that that's my you know I, i'm mainly you know i i really dig you know the the horror aspect of the stuff so even when i go on to the forums you know there's people there that like the horror stuff but i'm also you know starting to get into you know the different stuff the sea monkeys you know and all these other these other oh. different items so it's also a learning tool too i you know i'm learning so much from everybody on there yeah, yeah well the thing i was going to say to you is i actually one of the good things that todd is not in social media is i, I kind of blocked him Block commenting, <laughs> you know, because you heard the last letter he sent me. I don't want him to put that on the post. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now obviously, Eddie, you have not <laughs> been to your forum since yesterday to see what I posted. Uh, yes, I I have not been on the forum because I usually go in at late wee hours of the morning. I'm a night guy. Uh -huh. I, I go to bed yeah, four five that, in the morning. So was, <laughs> that that was my uh. That that that's my my plan tonight is to, to visit the forum because I know I I got the email alerts that there's some new stuff on there. So. Well, well, just so people out there who don't who don't know what we're talking about, it kind of are filled in a little bit. Um, any site house of the unusual, it has like a members forum, and so one of the posts that Joe um, started kind of a dialogue on was to post what your favorite or like old comic book ad was. So there was an ad I was looking for and I made a post and that was something that um, Eddie referenced earlier on. But I just posted an ad. I hate to, I hate to see what it is. It <laughs> is so rare that nobody has ever seen it before. You sure I haven't seen it? I'm absolutely 100% <laughs> positive that neither you nor Joe nor anybody else on the planet except for me has seen this comic book ad. Oh man, now now you've got my no. You know you know what it is. Hooked. You know why? Because it's invisible. When you go there, it's not invisible. You're guaranteed not to see anything. That's why. I, I tell you, man, those it's times, the invisible my wife's still, ad. My wife's still trying to figure out what I bought, and I'm like, honey, trust me, they're there. And she goes, Eddie, what you see. It's kind of like Ripley's believing now. <laughs> you see it, but you don't. 
you know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you, you it, it, it's, uh, it was my way of thanking you for the gift that's coming my way. And I encourage anybody out there, go, you know, go on House of the Unusual, become a member, log in, make fun of Eddie, be nice. You know. <laughs> oh, Let me, he calls me every day, <laughs> twice a day that the mailman still hasn't bought it. He called me ten, three hours after I mailed it out. <laughs> I told him, you got to stop watching Bugs Bunny. When he, you know, when he places an order, stands by the mailbox, and then the guy in the little motorcycle brings it. It just don't happen that yeah. way. <laughs> No, well, gen- well, well, gentlemen, we're getting ready to uh, to wrap it up here. We got any any final uh, thoughts uh, for our audience out there? I'll say something. <laughs> Anybody who listened to this, God bless you. And the other <laughs> thing I would say is I'm sorry, uh, but a uh, boy, if if uh, grown men lamenting about their childhood is your thing, this is the place. Go to House of the Unusual. It's it, it, they got great stuff. I love that Eddie is continuing that old mail order tradition. Um, it's all a good thing. And what what I'm going to say is <clears throat> I'm glad that both Todd and Joe have become a part of my life. I'm very proud of that. Very happy that they uh, have decided to become a part of House of the Unusual. And like I said to people, we're not there to sell you stuff. I mean, you go, if you buy, you want to buy, you can buy. But I'm saying go to join the forum with people like-minded. Yeah. And let's talk and discuss the fun parts because I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of stories to say. And, you know, yeah. it would be nice if they posted there. Yep. And, well, and you know, just to lament what you guys have said, you know, it, it is, it's a community, it's a family, and, you know, we're, we're there to have fun. So, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for stopping in tonight and, and sharing their past memories and, and history and, and their love for, for the product. So um, good night, guys. Uh, one thing I wanted to say really quick, guys, before we close, is that um, we hope to have Todd here as a regular guest once in a while uh, because the situation is that Todd, well, you know, he's got a heck of a character. You know what I mean? <laughs> we need to have him. The indelible he, character of Ty. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. That the character. And you know what? This maybe someday he'll give me the actual invisible thing I'm waiting for. But anyway. Well, hold on. For now, what what Eddie's saying is is that I'm his free laugh track. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's there right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so that's the best one of all. You're right. So having said that, all right, guys. Thank, thank you, guys. Always a pleasure. All right, guys. Good night. Good night. <laughs>